Windows 10 has officially reached end of life. And as this progression goes, they're moving more and more towards online accounts. And then they're going to be using this information for interesting things. Auto saving your documents, facial recognition on your faces, all sorts of neat stuff. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the end of Windows 10 stuff here real quick and then move into where they are going and what you might want to consider doing for yourself. Thanks for checking out this video by Switch to Linux. And today we are going to spend some time talking about the end of Windows 10. Of course, the official, you know, standard free end of life has reached now. And you can, of course, EU has the free end of life program. However, that still requires you to have a Windows account, a Microsoft account tied in. And indeed, what we see here is that um, there are some ways to get that for free. If you create the account and sync, some, some resources say it's your settings. Some people are saying it's your files. According to Microsoft, officially, it's having a Windows account or Microsoft account and syncing your PC settings is what allows you to sign up to that for free. So it's not altogether different than the EU version of the extended support. Of course, that only gets a standard consumer one year of extended support. So in one year from now, we'll be all repeating these videos again as the official end of Windows 10 is finally here. Since what we're seeing right now is kind of like more of a quasi unofficial. But let this be the note and the warning to you. If you have waited this long and you're tying yourself into these Microsoft systems, think back and say, maybe I need to change a few things. So set yourself a goal to be off of the Windows platform for your personal life within one year next time. So that's what we want to talk about a little bit today. And uh, over here on Windows 10 end of life countdown, will your PC be obsolete and uh, this is actually an interesting one here because really they get into it. You know, you, your computer is not going to simply stop working. And no, it's not true. People are going back to Windows 7. I know that was a headline um, a little bit ago. And a few people have even reported just like that. I dug into those data and said, no, it's some weird uh, anomaly in, in mostly in China that causes big worldwide spike. A little bit of spike in Germany from 7. Nowhere else in the world did Windows 7 spike. You can keep using your Windows 10 computer as many people have kept on using Windows 7 computers and it's not going to stop working. In fact, you're going to get the uh, the Windows Defender updates until I think at least 2028, even on a Windows 10 platform, which should fix most of the problems. But your basic security patches will go away. And so, of course, in this article here, what they're kind of talking about is, yeah, the, the computer will still keep talking. Windows uh, uh, Defender will have updates until uh, 2028. But what happens is you may see some compatibility issues with drivers, with new hardware, and maybe even some services. Microsoft might decide to cut things off after a period of time. Ultimately, like Steam might stop supporting Windows 10, but they probably won't do that for a long time yet to come. And uh, there's a lot of other a lot a lot of other issues. The thing is, is that all of these articles from Windows Central, I'll get on and talk about. You know, well, you just got to switch to Windows 11. They do not give any credence at all to ecosystems outside of Windows. And that in and of itself is is a little bit frightening. Uh, they say you do not have to buy a new PC. You don't have to buy a new PC immediately after October 14th. Your device running Windows 10 will function. You can extend it with the ESU program or by switching to another operating system. I guess that's about the closest they get, but they don't, you know, they don't actually tell you that that would be Linux and how easy it is. But however, if you rely on your computer for critical daily tasks or online activities, investing in a Windows 11 compatible device is safest, the most future proof choice. No, actually, Linux would be the most future proof choice because they will not give you these arbitrary cutoffs that says, well, your, your perfectly good computer simply no longer works. So just throw the thing in the trash can. Uh, so no, investing in a Windows 11 compatible device is not the best way to have a safe and 
future proof, especially since talk about safety. I tie that into privacy and some of the things that Microsoft is starting to do are a little bit creepy, as we will get into near the end of this video. Uh, but then uh, Windows 10 is about to die. Here's a wonderful argle, argue, uh, article here about um, how to safely and securely delete all of your data off of your perfectly good computer so you can throw it away safely as you move on to the next computer. So we're not going to really go into that. It's just kind of funny. They're giving us entire articles about how to securely wipe your data so that uh, you, know, you can throw away your perfectly good computer. And that's kind of one of the things that uh, we need to think about. Like, uh, why are we doing this? Of course, a lot of this is just to push everybody into the cloud resources and things. And the reality is, looking at these various cloud resources, Microsoft wants everybody in. This is why we covered the video last week, why they are starting to do um, uh, getting away around all the ways to create a local account on Windows. And, and you wouldn't believe the number of comments I saw and the number of comments you saw on, on Twitter and people talking about, well, you could just create a Microsoft account and then set your computer up. And like, you are really advocating going through the step of setting up a Microsoft account that you're simply going to throw away, just set up a computer. I'm sorry, stop drinking the Kool-Aid. Why don't you just push back and say, no, nah, we just don't want a computer. I cannot set off offline. Even that, I, I don't know if they're completely removing the ability to do full local accounts, but they are really, really working hard to make sure that people are effectively being forced to create a Microsoft account. Of course, this authenticates you. They tie and try and tie these to phone numbers, to biometric data, all sorts of things. And then they, of course, try and sync your files to it. And uh, we actually talked about it uh, about uh, about a month ago or so uh, with Microsoft wants to new, do a new default to save all of your documents in the cloud. And I did this article here in early September. Yeah, when this was coming out around, but then it actually turns out that uh, uh, just this week people are reporting on this, and uh, word is changing forever. Your new documents will now live in the cloud by default. So this is basically just a a public rollout. The previous video that I did was talking about the the um, uh, automatically save all your documents to the cloud was in the developer previews. This is officially being rolled out. It's announced at a OneDrive and Copilot event last week. And effectively what it means is that every one of your documents is going to save itself automatically to the cloud, which of course they know you have because they're doing everything possible to make sure that you have a Microsoft account when you set everything up because they want copies of your documents. They want to be able to scan those for different things. That's kind of frightening. Um, and we can just assume anything Microsoft uh, gets out of your data is going to be used. So they did announce this is rolling out uh, very, very soon publicly to everybody. Remember, some things that land in developer previews don't ever don't always make it into the final product. This one seems to be, and they've already done public conferences about it. So all of your documents are going to be saving themselves to the cloud. But that's not the only fun thing. I saw an article this morning about... Um, uh, Microsoft is going to add AI facial recognition to OneDrive. Now, this isn't too unlike what Apple does with their phones, I don't know, like five or so years ago, where you could go in and um, just on your camera roll, you could type in like people and you'd see all, it would sort your your camera roll by all the people with people. You could say dog and it'd sort it by every picture that had a dog in it. And there were fun things people were doing, like, you know, busts and things like that. And, uh, so you could um, get some interesting stuff in there. And of course, Google has a similar option as well, but this one's a little different in that it's utilizing AI facial recognition. See, those will sort what ones have faces, what one have dogs, which ones have cats. This can actually sort by specific people. So you can say, find my friends or family in the photos that I have uploaded. And uh, this ties into the video we did, uh, I think it was last week or so, on the Weekly News Roundup, where we talked about respecting other people's privacy. It's one thing if I want to give all of my data to Microsoft, but what about 
the fact that so many of these systems exist where somebody can give someone else's data to them, which are being used by facial recognition or AI platforms or things like this. Now, Microsoft has said, we're not training your data on AI. You know, we're not training our AI on their stuff, you know, but you can just use it to upload it. Same thing that, that, uh, uh, Amazon is doing with the ring cameras. We discussed in that uh, weekly news roundup article where you can basically program in certain faces and Amazon's AI facial recognition is going to give a different response to a person on a special family list than they would to a total stranger. And that I, I think should be completely illegal. We need to pass laws against that because I did not consent to give my name and facial information to Amazon or to Microsoft in this case. But that is really what they're doing it and what's causes a lot of people right now to question what's going on here is you can only disable this three times a year well what if microsoft keeps on accidentally re-enabling it after every update they like to do what if they just randomly decide to re-update it i'm clear dude you're not doing your i mean think of how many times your windows computers give you a notification that you're, you're not using OneDrive. come on why are you not using OneDrive? and they try and turn on your you know your OneDrive stuff and uh, now you can only disable it three times a year well is it ever going to turn back on that's an interesting uh, piece of information so they roll out AI facial recognition to recognize people and photos. Now, it's not just people. They actually say in their uh, in their system. So this says it's like uh, AI features uh, similar to Google and uh uh, no, I'm not interested in your crap. Uh, similar to Google and, and Apple. The problem is, is though that this one can actually you be used for identifying specific people. This is the actual toggle switch on the phone. OneDrive uses AI to recognize faces in your photos to help you find photos of friends and family, not just pictures with people friends and family, which means Microsoft is working on an AI system that knows who people's friends and families are. This is a surveillance state, guys. We need to push back against this really, really hard. I know. Uh, so uh, the discovery comes from Slashdot. Discover Microsoft's warning after uploading an image from local storage on their smartphone to Microsoft's OneDrive file hosting app. After the upload was complete, the user ventured to privacy and permission section and discovered people section featured along with the description, OneDrive uses AI to recognize faces in your photo. According to the description, it uses it to sift through their collection of photos to find specific people, such as family or friends. And think of it as Google Photos people, but on OneDrive. And I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't know. It does Google's do the same thing, which I wouldn't advocate for that either. Uh, what is probably the most concerning aspect is you can only turn off the setting three times. So this is that setting. You can only turn it off three times. They say after they turn it off within 30 days, they will, uh, they will delete the data. And their reasoning for only three times a year is because of the processing power to manage and delete all of this data. Um, maybe just turning it on three times a year might be the problem. Turning it off is easy. Just delete, you know. Uh, and so that's kind of what is going on. So here's a what I want to leave you with. If you need to use cloud services, I'd recommend looking at NextCloud. Now, um, I believe there are places where you can get NextCloud uh, just using it. In fact, there's a try now option. Let's just see where we go. Now, I self-host all of mine on my own server. As you can see here, this is more like an organizational type thing. Um, but uh, you can very, very easy to spin up a NextCloud all in one instance. On my NextCloud instance, I can share files, we can share photos, we can share documents, we can do uh, we can do talk features. I disable the talk features in mine because I use Jitsi for everything I would otherwise do that for. Uh, but we can do collaboration on documents and things like that. The thing is, is that NextCloud can replace all of this stuff. And being as that it's not on a centralized server, it's on your own private self-hosted servers and it's all encrypted is so much better than utilizing this. In fact, if you want to set one of these up, you could be like, and I know a lot of families do things like that. Let's just all pitch in let's all just pitch in the you know what would it cost per year i mean i'm paying 18 dollars. let me let's see where's my calculator at can i even find my calculator down here i'm paying 18 dollars a month and uh, so that's 216 dollars a year is what i'm paying and i can easily support 20 or so 10 or 20 people on my next cloud instance so a family could put together 
200 bucks a year for one person in that family to be running a NextCloud, self-hosted NextCloud instance on their accounts. And that would give them, them the privacy and the freedom to share whatever family documents that they need to share in this digital world without having to rely on these big tech companies and without them utilizing all of those photos and whatnot for their own ends. I would highly recommend doing this. Of course, I use... Um, I think I'm using DigitalOcean for that one. You can just go into the DigitalOcean Marketplace, do the all-in-one NextCloud instance. It spins itself up in a hot second, super easy to do, and very easy to manage and maintain. And it is not an expensive platform. So I'd highly encourage everyone to look at this as an option. For your office documents, hey, LibreOffice is not going to be working with all this AI nonsense. It's not going to be uploading your stuff automatically to clouds. It's not going to be asking for a license subscriptions. It's not going to be doing all sorts of things that uh, we find distasteful oftentimes. Free and open source available for download on any of your platforms that you're currently using. And I'd highly recommend you have a look at LibreOffice because you do not need Microsoft Office. There, I, I would be hard pressed to find any task that if you were tell tell me you got to use Microsoft as I couldn't do it with LibreOffice instead. And this is absolutely what you should do. Of course, if you're still running on Windows 10, maybe you've signed up for those extended use platforms, start experimenting with Linux Mint this year. Now, there's other Linux distributions as well. This is the one I always steer people to start with, and I highly recommend you have a look at that. Um, but uh, Linux Mint 22.2 is the primary one. Of course, as I am recording this video, LMDE 7 has just released uh, this week. So this is the brand new version based on the Debian uh, platform. So there are a lot of good options in this, and I'd highly recommend you have a look at Linux Mint in any one of the options. Uh, for a brand new personal Linux, I just use the Linux Mint 22.2. Get yourself familiar with Linux, and then if you want to, branch off to other distributions from there. So there are our thoughts. Let me know your thoughts on all these in the comments down below.